the Commodore Hotel was safe. And then you went out into a very grave civil war. كنا بالكومودور تجمع كبير للصحفيين وصار في اشتباك مسلح. If the Commodore hadn't been there, the Israeli invasion would not have been so well reported. It was a great news center, and overall was this godfather of the journalists, Yusuf Nazar. The next room I was in was underground in a tiny, filthy, dirty prison cell, basically, as a hostage. Welcome to 1960s Beirut. For several decades, this cosmopolitan city attracted international jet setters who could get from the ski slopes to the beach in no time. The hotel district was at the heart of its luxury tourism economy. And in its heyday, hotels like the St. George, the Phoenicia and the Holiday Inn were full of wealthy tourists, businessmen, journalists, diplomats, and the occasional spy. Travelers on a tighter budget stayed at hotels like the Commodore, and in the mid-1970s, it became host to the world's media when the Lebanese civil war erupted. In 1970, a young Arab millionaire, Yusuf Nazal, took the Commodore Hotel on a 20-year lease from the Kuwaiti royal family. Nazal was a leading investor in the hotel industry in the region and responsible for attracting thousands of tourists to Lebanon. Mohamed Shabaro worked with Nizal in ticketing and still runs a travel agency near the Commodore with the same name. I started with Sayyid Yusuf Nizal in the Fundoq of the Commodore from 1971. The country was in all the sea. From the start, Sayyid Yusuf Nizal was not able to فندق ملكارت وفندق أتلانتيك بهذاك الوقت وكنا عم نفتش على فنادق أخرى حتى نستأجرها. But the luxury Beirut lifestyle obscured a gap between rich and poor that was widening all the time. The international press used Beirut as a barometer of what was happening in the Middle East. And one of the foreign correspondents who predicted the violence in Lebanon was ITV's Jonathan Dimbleby. I first went to Lebanon in 1972 as a young reporter, and I wanted to see whether something was happening there or not. I stayed in what was then relatively modest hotel called the Commodore Hotel. The overall impression was of some, 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 a society which was held together by a rather loose series of ropes, and it didn't take much for that to shatter. The 13th of April, 1975, marked the official start of the Civil War. It was a proxy conflict fought during the Cold War. On one side, Lebanese Christian right-wing parties backed by the US wanted to end the armed Palestinian presence in Lebanon. On the other were Muslim left-wing parties allied with the PLO and backed by the Soviet Union. They saw the right-wing Christians as simply an extension of Israeli and American influence in the country. When the war broke out, an army of foreign journalists headed to Beirut including the former BBC Middle East correspondent Tim Llewellyn, all of whom wanted a safe place to stay. 
In November 1975, I was taking what turned out to be one of the last MEA flights into Beirut from London, which was virtually empty except for a few journalists and Yusuf Nazao, who I didn't know, but of course was to, it was to turn out that he was the manager of the Commodore Hotel. So he drew me, he took out a piece of paper and a pen, and he drew for me the various sections of Beirut, who controlled what, where you could go safely. I said to Yusuf, what we needed was a base. The next time I went to Beirut, Yusuf had created this fantastic hotel. In the space of a few weeks, the Commodore had become that journalistic center. 1975 and 76 were the fiercest two years of the Civil War, with sectarian killings, massive destruction, and the division of Beirut into the Christian East and Muslim West. The former Times correspondent Robert Fisk decided to base himself permanently in Beirut in 1976. So when I came to Beirut, I already knew the city, but I knew it before the one. I went downtown here, and I could not believe the, the extraordinary destruction. I mean, it takes, it, you can destroy a city very quickly. It takes an awful long time to rebuild it. I occasionally went to the Commodore with AP staff just to have lunch sometimes and meet other journalists, but I didn't stay there. I didn't like it very much when I, I thought it was another seedy hotel with extraordinary high prices. The Commodore Hotel was safe and so you could be there, and it was quite bizarre, really. You could be in this little safe enclave, and then you went out into a very grave civil war. Under Yusuf Nazal's management, the Beirut Commodore became a global center for news and information. Well, Yusuf Nazal was a young man then, and he seemed to have an an extraordinary, uncanny ability to know what journalists wanted. And he realized quickly and brilliantly that the journalists would need, first of all, above all, good communications. What the Commodore had and what nowhere else had was communications. And you know, if a journalist has a story and he can't send it, he might as well go home. And you had three working telex machines and they could get your call to London. Yusuf Nazal started by using lines and telex machines from his private business in Beirut, London, Amman and Cyprus. But as reporter demands grew, he had to get hold of extra lines at any cost. لذلك كان صحفيين يوقفوا بالصف حتى يمروا رسائلهم لشركات تعيتهم. As the war spread and militias took control of different neighborhoods, the challenge for the Commodore was to keep the hotel safe for its media guests. I was there on one occasion, and we were down in the bar, and suddenly there was a fantastic noise of gunfire from inside the hotel. Everyone ducked down, I mean, get, get, you know, everyone was on the floor, and the, the brrrr, like that, stopped silence. The only sound was of the parrot, which had a peculiar position on the edge of the bar, and the parrot uh, talked quite freely while everyone else was silent, which made you half, you know, in, in, when, you're in, when you're frightened, <laughs> you, you wanted to laugh in a way, because this funny squawking parrot was going on talking. The African parrot's name was Coco, and his party tricks became legendary. This parrot used to do various things. It could do the opening notes of the Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and various other things, but its, uh, its piece de resistance was to imitate an incoming shell. <sighs> On the 6th of June, 1982, Israel invaded Lebanon. 
Israel claimed it wanted to take out the PLO's rocket launcher positions. But there was more than that to the Israeli action. The Israeli siege of Beirut was one of the bloodiest episodes of the whole sorry conflict. The destruction was enormous, and 20,000 Lebanese and Palestinians were killed and nearly 50,000 wounded. Amid the mayhem, the Commodore Hotel became the de facto Ministry of Information. Lebanese photojournalist Ramzi Haider was at the Commodore during the Israeli invasion. In the early days of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon, Yusuf Nazal stockpiled large amounts of fuel, food, and cash. Millions of dollars, he said, enough for the hotel residents and staff for the months to come. Nazal also lent journalists money. كان الصحفيين الاجانب يجوا معهم كميه معينه من الكاش وما يقدروا يامنوا فاتوره الاوتيل او مصاريف السواقين او مصروفهم الشخصي يضطر السيد يوسف نزال يتحمل كل مصاريفهم ويعطيهم كاش ماني مقابل انه يحطوا له فلوس بحسابه برات لبنان Life for the Commodore-based journalists during the invasion was tough. West Beirut was under siege, with constant Israeli air raids and reportedly indiscriminate shelling. But they told the real story. I think the Beirut siege, uh, as I said, was a big eye-opener for many correspondents who'd only eaten the Israeli story until then. Um, and they were able at first hand when they went out to see the suffering of Lebanese and Palestinians. And they really went after the story very, very, hard, very hard and harshly and well. I, I think at that stage though, if, it, if the Commodore hadn't been there, the Israeli invasion would not have been so well reported. And we can thank the Commodore in a way for this and the people in it under Yusuf Nazal. I think the, uh, the Israelis had at that stage in the early 80s, the worst press they've ever had, before or since. The 70-day Israeli siege of Beirut was lifted on the 21st of August, 1982, and the PLO pulled out of Lebanon. There were immediate presidential elections, and the leader of the right-wing Christian phalangists, Bashir Jamayel, who had supported the Israeli incursion, became the president-elect of Lebanon. But Jamal never took office. He was assassinated 23 days later. For the following three days, the 16th, 17th, and 18th of September 1982, Christian militias supported by Israel took part in a massacre at the Palestinian refugee camps of Sabra and Shatila. When news of the massacre reached the Commodore Hotel on the 18th, Dozens of local and foreign journalists headed straight to the southern Beirut suburb. Robert Fisk was one of the first to enter the Palestinian camps. I've never before had to walk on carpets of dead bodies in my life, and the smell was appalling. And um, we went on the Saturday morning when the Kataib, the phalanges, were still there. The murderers were still, were still in, in the camp. <laughs> انه انا من الناس اللي عرفوا مصدر صبر وشتيلة من اوتيل كومودور والمدير تبعي كان بينام بالكومودور يعني هو عرف انه موجود هذا المصدر وقتها وانا هيك عرفت ورح صورت اصلا الكومودور لعب دور اثناء مصدر صبر وشتيلة بما انه هو مركز تجمع للصحفيين كان في سرعة اكثر لنشر الخبر The Sabra and Shatila massacres saw over 2,000 Palestinian and Lebanese civilians killed. I started writing and writing and writing. Um, 
Unfortunately, the Times didn't come out on Sunday, so I had to wait for the next day's paper. Uh, but I got all the story. I got it all. News of the 18th of September massacres shocked the world, and the international coverage angered the Israelis. And destroy the terrorist organizations. The same day, they arrested Yusuf Nazal and took him to their base at the St. George Hotel. The journalists became extremely angry. The French, typically French, organized a petition, a signed petition, and took it down to the Israeli commander, demanding that Yusuf Nazal be released. Yes, I wasn't surprised he was arrested because they realized this was a communication center and they didn't want it to operate. I think the purpose of arresting Yusuf was to close down the Commodore. Eight years into the fighting, on the night of the 30th of August, 1983, the Commodore took a direct hit, shattering its eastern side. New and inexperienced reporters were sometimes unable to handle Beirut. And Yusuf Nazal's office sometimes doubled as a psychiatric unit. As the Israeli withdrawal continued into 1983, Lebanese militias immediately filled that vacuum and vied for control region by region. The Commodore had continued as an international news hub. Philippe Bilar worked as a cameraman for CBC and took these photos of life inside the hotel at that time. But in 1984, a new development in the conflict upset that life even more. Kidnapping. The Commodore Hotel, I think, was beginning to lose its attraction as a journalistic enterprise around the time of the mid-1980s, around the time of the kidnapping. I think the, the fear of kidnapping started around 84. Um, I had, there was an attempted kidnapping on me in uh, Madame Curie Street, uh, very close to the Commodore. I certainly remember that was the first time I started getting really frightened. Uh, and then, of course, not long afterwards, uh, Terry Anderson was kidnapped, longest held hostage, almost seven years. And then we all realized we were in trouble. Terry Anderson was the senior Associated Press correspondent. On the 16th of January, 1985, he was kidnapped on his way to the Commodore Hotel. Three years into his detention, his kidnappers released this photo of him wearing a Commodore Hotel T-shirt designed by Youssef Nazal for his journalist guests. Anderson was the first journalist to be kidnapped in Beirut, but would be the last to be released in 1991. Several different groups carried out the hostage taking, but the most prominent was Islamic Jihad. So now I wouldn't advise uh, any foreigners to stay here at the moment while the situation is so dangerous. In November 1985, the special envoy to the British Archbishop of Canterbury, Terry Waite, arrived in Lebanon to negotiate hostage releases. He stayed at the Riviera Hotel, but often went to the Commodore to meet journalists. On the 21st of November, fighting known as the Battle of the Flag between different left-wing allied Lebanese militias controlling West Beirut reached the Commodore Hotel. Terry Waite was trapped inside with dozens of local and foreign journalists, including Ramsey Haider.
Ramsey Hyder photographed these images of journalists pulling the man's body out of sniper range, then moving it into the back of a car. That image encapsulates the horror of events outside the Commodore Hotel. That night, Terry Waite stayed at the Commodore, and these rare pictures show him making phone calls in the hotel lobby. Negotiations for the release of hostages had so far failed, and the kidnapping continued. On the 16th of March, 1986, the British journalist John McCarthy arrived in Beirut as WTN bureau chief. It was his first assignment to a war zone. He checked in to the Commodore opposite WTN's offices, excited to be staying at the now legendary hotel. I think I had a rather romantic view of what the Commodore would be like. Um, I had heard from other colleagues uh, who'd been there and stayed there and was very aware that it was a famous hotel where all the great journalists stayed. Um, so when I got there, I was surprised because it was nearly empty. The street fighting and fear of kidnap drove many foreigners out of West Beirut, to the Christian east side or out of Lebanon to neighboring Cyprus. So I was told, you must be careful. It, it, you know, you, you'll be a target possibly for one of these kidnap groups. Uh, so stay close to the office uh, in the Hammer district and stay close to the hotel, the Commodore. By April 1986, 30 foreign nationals had been kidnapped in Lebanon. It didn't occur to John McCarthy that he might be next. It seemed like you know, an era for this hotel, for Lebanon, for the foreign journalists working there. It was coming to an end. It was closing in around, around me, uh, but also it felt as if the hotel was sort of closing down too. McCarthy was then ordered by his WTN bosses in London to leave Beirut immediately. On the 17th of April, 1986, he checked out of the Commodore and headed for the airport. But within minutes, armed men intercepted his car, grabbed him and took him away. John McCarthy would be the last foreign journalist to stay at the Commodore. So it's extraordinary. I started off that morning in, in April 1986, leaving this rather grand, if dilapidated, suite at, at the Commodore Hotel. And the, the next room I was in was underground in a tiny, filthy, dirty prison cell, basically, uh, as a hostage. And I was to remain a hostage for the next five and a quarter years. Nine months after McCarthy's abduction, on the 17th of January, 1987, Hostage negotiator Terry Waite was also kidnapped. He was last seen on the Beirut Corniche, surrounded by gunmen from the Druze Progressive Socialist Party, who were acting as his bodyguards. In my last year of captivity, I was held with the two Americans, Terry Anderson and Tom Sutherland, uh, and also with the uh, Englishman Terry Waite, who'd gone out to Lebanon to try and negotiate our release a few years earlier, but himself been kidnapped. Uh, so it was very strange that there we were in a cell uh, with the guy who tried to rescue us, and he'd ended up being a hostage too. Within hours of Terry Waite's abduction, a fierce battle ensued in West Beirut. 200 people died in the five days' fighting, and the Commodore was almost completely destroyed by fire. And there was another kidnap, the victim this time, Coco the Parrot. Hotel manager Ahmed Shabaro checked on the staff and damage the next day. He contacted the owner, Yusuf Nazal, who was abroad, to reassure him the staff were OK, but that the hotel was so damaged, it was now uninhabitable. I said, to the hotel, in 2002, a new investor bought the Commodore. It was completely refurbished, 
and revived as a five-star luxury hotel in the heart of Beirut. American journalist Nicholas Tatro perhaps best summed it up when he wrote during the Israeli siege of Beirut, in a city of survivors, the Commodore Hotel has proven itself to be a survivor with a touch of class. There is no conflict which is simple goodies versus baddies. It's always more complicated than that. And I'd add one more thing. Find a good, safe hotel.